when I said, if you need to use the bathroom in this message, go use the bathroom. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you for your undivided attention. Okay? It says, um, I'm going to ask you for your undivided attention. Matter of fact, I want us to just continue to stay still uh, as much as possible. I'm also going to ask this, and I'm, I'm not a fit. I, I'm going to explain my spirit in this. But if you have younger children that are that, if you have younger children, we have uh, we have a lot more help in Catafam today, and they will love on them. They will love on them, and uh, you can go back to ushers are waiting back there to help you with that. The reason I'm asking for this is I this is um, this is going to be probably the hardest and heaviest message I've ever preached in my life. And I want to be focused. I don't want you to just be focused. All of you, I want to be focused for you. I want to give you my very best because that is what we deserve as a family. And, um, and so, as I, so I want you to know the spirit in that. Um, also, uh, online, I want you to know that um, I know that a lot of, a lot of the Catafam can't be here right now. I wish you could be here. I miss you. And um, I hate it that you have to just see me and not all this beautifulness, but uh, I'm thankful that you still choose Catalyst to worship with. Uh, Guest, my guest out there, I want you to know that even though this is going to be a different Sunday message and a difficult one, I want you to know that it's really a great Sunday for you to be here because you're not going to need a couple weeks to get clarity on who we are as a church. You're going to be able to know right today if you'll ever come back again, and that's okay. I'm glad. I'm okay with that. And you should be too because you don't have to waste your time. Um, We're glad you're here. We're thankful. We're very, very thankful for you. And um, and I want to do my best for you. Online, I'm asking you. We welcome you. I'm glad you're here once more, and I want you, the same goes for you. I want you to hear my heart in this. Matter of fact, will you just stretch your hands one more time? towards me lord right now i just i don't want to just speak my heart i want you to speak yours i need your strength i need your spirit you know that i've sought you but i also uh, need your strength and i'm grateful and i believe that you're about to give it and i receive all of it in jesus name amen the term it is what it is uh has been around a lot longer than president trump when he said it a few weeks back the term it, it is what it is has been around a lot longer than I've been around. And, um, it, it, and that term is not my title today. My title, the title of this message is this is what it is. Matter of fact, online, I know that y'all need to engage. I want you to comment right now and speak to somebody. Speak to somebody that you are um, don't even know who you're speaking to or what you're speaking to and they don't yet either and say it and put this in all caps when you say it this is what it is. I want everybody in person look at somebody close to you and tell them speak to a situation they don't even know you're speaking to and you don't either and say this is what it is. Oh, y'all going to have to wake up. This is going to be an intent. Say this is what it is. This, this is what it is. Because I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter if the seasons or your circumstances or situations change today or next year, they don't have to change for you to take ownership of your life and you change. This, this is what it is. There comes a time in your life, there comes a time in your family, there comes a time with your, your kids, there comes a time in your career, there comes a time in your marriage and with your spouse that you have to draw a line, set the terms, and say this is what it is. And if when that season comes, when that season comes, if you do not draw the line, it will be drawn for you. And people and life and mostly the choices that you did or didn't make will decide it for you and I'm here to do that for Catalyst Church today I'm here to do that for Catalyst Church because your job as a parent of your children is to nurture and protect the very best so that it comes out of them and my job as pastor of Catalyst Church is to protect the beautiful part of this place and I will tell you that uh, our culture and our church is healthy and I'm going to make sure we're going to make sure it stays that way we're going to make sure it stays that way I 
I was praying last week. And I mean, I can honestly say this as far as my faith in God and as a person and a pastor. The single greatest contributor to who I am is my mother. Is my mother. And uh, my mother, for a long season, lost uh, herself. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for her because um, she is now, for a long time now, reclaiming what she invested in me so deeply. A couple years ago, we were talking, and she said, the difference in you and me, Ben, is uh, you never lost hope in what I taught you. And I can tell you that the gospel will only do what you let it do. God can only change your life as much as you will let him change it. Catalyst Church, the message and the principles that we preach and the promises of God that we stand on will only do as much as you're willing for it to do. You got to want it. You got to want it. You can hear the messages we preach and you can do nothing with them. And it's anything with God. What God wants to do in your life, it doesn't work if you don't work it. It does not work if you don't work it. Every message that I've ever preached on this platform is a message and principles that have changed my life and continue to change my life and will continue to change my life. Somewhere along the line, Derek, my co-pastor, my brother, my family, lost, lost himself. He got consumed by life at some point. And as I share parts of his story Today, throughout this message, I want you to know a couple things. My Harper family will always be my family. And Derek, I feel the same way. He's a lifetime. He is a faithful friend and family. And all the Harper family love this place so much that I don't even know what direction it's in. But they're serving in catechids so that you can have a seat to hear this. I want you to know that as I put this out there, I'm doing it so that not, not only you can be aware of it, but so that you can learn from it. I think Derek is clear enough right now that he wants you to learn from it. Right now we live in a world of people that have lost themselves in this season. I pastor a beautiful family and I know that I've seen so many people inside this family and outside that have become disconnected and lost themselves. We live in a country and the church participates in it because pastors have the philosophy and the um, perspective that if you, dis and they preach it, if you disagree with me, then you're the enemy. And that is not at all how Jesus lived this life. We have a political world, both sides, every side, that would have, have politics have pitted us to get against each other as a people. Period. It's pitted us against each other. The hardest season of my life, the pastor most is this one because I've seen so many people that have been so disconnected and have begun to make bad decisions that they stopped making as they grew. Jason and Tara are counseling pastors. We were crying recently. I went to their house to visit Jason who's in the hospital. We just started crying because it's broken our hearts to see the people that we counseled before Quarantine. A lot of people that we helped find God and lead them out of a hole, walk away from darkness, and then get disconnected. And, and person after person walk right back into the darkness that they walked out of when they came into Catalyst. I can tell you some of you were probably watching, watching online and you should be here. And you better know that I care about you. That's why, I'm, that's why it's killing me in this season. Because I've seen people that need to be here, that want to be here, that love to be here, and they have disconnected from life. And it's broken my heart. It's broken my heart. There's so many people that have lost themselves in this season. You may not, your life may have not fallen apart, but I promise you, most everybody in this room and online, there is less love, there is less love in your heart and more anger than ever before, at least in a long time. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, he said, what you say flows from what is in your heart. Jesus said, if you want to see where a person is, don't look at their habits even. Look at their mouth. Look at what's coming out of their mouth. Jesus was saying, look at their Facebook and social media posts. Look at their rants. Look at the way they respond Look at the content of their conversation. 
Look at how they talk about people and talk to people. Look at how they treat people. Look at the attitudes they have when their backs are against the wall and people don't agree with them. Jesus said, if you want to know what's in somebody's heart, don't look, don't look at everything they do. Look at what they're saying. Because he says, your mouth will tell on your heart. You know why there's so many people, many of us included, that walk around and we're, we're acting like wounded dogs while accusing the other people of acting like wounded dogs? It's because that is where we are as a culture, a country, and a church. Our hearts, we've gotten lost. We've gotten lost. We've lost who we are. We've lost what we say we believe in, the God that we say we believe in. We've lost ourselves. We've closed off. We've shifted blame. We get mad and lash out at people who do the same things as we do, and we don't even realize it. If you looked at the last two presidential or the presidential and vice presidential debate and you only saw and posted about one side and one person who avoided and deflected and redirected and skewed facts and you're only pissed off about one side and that's all you saw, you were not paying attention because we have lost ourselves in this season. And when you lose yourself, not only does your heart change and you change, but you don't even recognize yourself. A lot of us lose ourselves because we stop making solid decisions. We stop making solid decisions. And if you're willing to take an honest look at yourself, which is what I will beg you to do every week, I'm up here. If you will look, take an honest look at yourself, and if you will look at your life and truly take an honest look at why you are not getting out of life what you once got out of it if you're willing to take an honest look what Jesus promises is you can draw a line and say this is what it is this is what it's going to be enough matter of fact when you look at somebody right now if you want to get something today and say enough enough it is time to draw a line in your personal lives, in your marriage, in the way you see life, in the way you address people, in the way you approach people. Look, you can vote for who you want to, but quit focusing more on Biden, Trump, and focus on the person in the mirror, and then God can do something in your life, and you can find yourself again and have some confidence, regardless of who's in the White House. Regardless of laws and legislations, Jesus is still on the throne. And you can preach that all day, but do you post like it? Because Jesus said, Jesus said, what's in a man flows out of his mouth. James, the brother of Jesus, played off. He said, if a man claims to be religious, but can't control his mouth, he fools himself and his religion is worthless. Because James, the brother of Jesus, knew that what, the reason Jesus could love people is because he looked at their hearts and he saw that they were lost and he wanted to love them back to finding themselves, not attack them. And we have lived in a season that our opinions have caused us to do attack people in the same ways that we blame them and judge them for attack. We live in a culture that encourages us to pretend. It's the, it's, the, it's the most cancerous part of our culture, our country, and our church is the biggest in it. By our church, the body of Christ at large. We don't even realize it. We tell people you don't have to pretend, but we live in a culture that we encourage people to pretend. We talk about, we, we encourage people to fake it till they make it. And here's the problem with that, is you can fake it. If you fake it, you, you will never make it faking it, I promise you. You can give the appearance of making it. You can make tons of money and people respect you. But until you stop pretending, you are never going to be able to respect yourself. Man, you can give the appearance of success. Everybody can look at you and say, oh, wow, they're great. 
Their 401k is big. Their house is big. And everybody can look at you. But until you are able to quit pretending, all it is is the appearance. And we live in a world that we tell people to pretend to be okay when they're not. And when we don't tell them, we truly don't have a culture. So you can preach, don't pretend, but people don't feel safe. So all they do is pretend. And Derek, man, Derek was, Derek is still the best at it. Not because he's fake. Derek's coping mechanism for years has been to the insecurities he had and what he's dealing with on the inside. He was always able to cut a joke, project confidence and competence, but inside I knew my best friend and brother for a long time. And for several years of this church, I knew something he was not what he projected. He was crushed. But he learned to pretend to be okay when he wasn't. And I want you to know that a lot of you have been in the same place and you've been in seasons of your life where you felt like you had to pretend to be strong when you were weak. You felt like you had to carry the pressure of the world when you couldn't. And you felt disloyal because you couldn't carry the pressure that other people wanted you to carry. And you pretended and you pretended and that's why you got a lot of anxiety. It's because at some point you didn't draw a line and say, this is what it is. I can't only do so much. I'm a great, pa I'm a better pastor, not a great one, but I'm a better one than I was last year and I'll be a better one next year because I know when I get up in the morning what I can give and take and I know I'm one man and if I can't give it to you, I'm not going to because I'm not going to put myself in the grave preaching to you how to live. I do not pretend. I guess it was the child, the, the family I was raised in, man. They, they may hurt your feelings. My mama, the Scudder side family, ooh. I'm the king of TMI. I am. I'm the, I'm the king of oversharing. I know it. Been told that I incessantly overshare, and yep, I do. I do it for a reason. I'll make you feel awkward on Sunday morning, on the, and I'll make you feel like, well, that was a little too much, and I'll do it on Tuesday and Thursday and every day in between. Because I found out a long time ago that you don't get the peace of God pretending. And let me tell you why that you will never, ever, ever get the peace that Jesus promised you pretending and holding back. I can teach you all day how much Jesus loves you, but how could you ever, how could you ever have the confidence that you are truly loved like that? How could you ever think that people love you for who you are when you have held back who you are and where you are and they don't even completely know you? So inside, the people closest to you tell you they love you, but they don't know you, so you truly can never have peace because you've been pretending. You've carried so much pressure pretending. And that's why when people compliment you, you can't receive it because you know that they don't know you because you've held back. Your spouse probably don't even know you because you've been holding back for 30 years. And so I decided a long time ago that the type of pastor that I'm going to be, person, parent, husband, is that you'll find out real quick, most of you first Sunday, if you can like me or even tolerate me. And I make that, I make that easy for you. Because I never want you to have to misread or guess where I am, who I am, where I stand. If I don't feel good about something, I'm a predictable person. And when you figure me, if you even get a little bit close to me, you'll probably know what's bothering me in any given moment. Let me give you a hint. I don't go out there in the lobby when I'm exhausted. You'll see me walking around here and you think I'm on my phone. I'm not on my phone. I need a break. Because I'm not going to pretend to be something that I cannot be to you. I miss you. I love you. But there are ways, days I walk off this stage and I have nothing left emotionally. And I don't feel bad about it. It is why the greatest insecurity of my heart, honestly, it's why the, the most defensive thing that I will get about anybody is when somebody misrepresents me. 
When somebody misrepresents my heart or says something I didn't say and tries to tell me I said it and I said it and no matter how I said it, that's what I meant by it. I can't stand it. I do not tolerate it because I give everything I have so that you never have to guess. I never want to give anybody a reason to misread or misinterpret where, how I feel, who I am, where I stand, what I'm doing. So I shock you on Sunday so that you don't have to be shocked on Wednesday. And I have the peace of God in my heart because I know that even in this next season of Catalyst, I know that I, I know that I can't be anything outside of who I am because that's why God, that's why I can handle what God has given me. There is no peace in pretending. And I want you to know that that's the biggest thing you need to know no matter how long this season of this virus lasts because we are far past the effects of our culture is way bigger than the fear and the effects and the heartbreak of this virus. That was just a starting point. And pretending, you don't get the peace of God pretending. And Derek, just like that, was his coping mechanism. It was his coping mechanism. And for a couple of years, I tried my best to, to figure out what it was, you know. I wrote the things he said on the stage. I didn't know what, what, what it was. I just knew he was in a bad place. And I didn't know how it was going to look. I just, I didn't know. And he, and, um, and when I got back from officiating the wedding, the last time we met, second Sunday I've missed in over three and a half years. He finally let me know where his head was and, And he made some really bad decisions. Really bad decisions. And I want you to know this. I want you to know from this stage that the details, every one of them will be common knowledge at some point. But right now, the people that are caught in the crossfire and hurting the most need some space to heal. And I know we're all hurting. Trust me, I've been at this thing two and a half weeks now. In quarantine with COVID dealing with this and I want you to know that I know that in the coming days that in the coming weeks and months my job as a pastor will be to make myself available to any questions you have anything you want to ask me and I'm up for it because I'm, that's who I am I'm going to tell you straight up where I'm at I'm a human being man and I'm angry I'm angry man I'm be, I will get past it and I will not let it grow me hard, but I'm angry. I did so well for about two weeks. And this week, I just, there was a time this week that I just, it was rehearsal for worship. I was so excited to get the band. And they probably don't even realize I was, I was upset because I lashed out. I, I'm angry. I handled it so well. I acted out. I am angry. I'm angry because, and I don't want y'all to know Derek is a, a wonderful person. He's not a bad person has a huge heart he carried way too much pressure and it crushed him and that's why I beg you to set the terms for your life and I'm going to set them for this church I'm angry 13 years Derek was never dishonest with me when I say he wasn't he told me the truth in times where it hurt me and he knew it was going to hurt me but he told me the truth And I know that there's a great potential and probability that there's going to be some people that think that at some point I've tried to cover it up or protect the church and that's not who I am. It's never who I'm going to be. But I'm angry because I'm in that position to have to handle that and I'll take it. I'll take it. I did it at my last church. And I, was, I did my last church. I was faithful to that church, died, and then we planted Catalyst and I'll take it again. But I'm still not, I'm still angry. I'm still hurt. And you're going to hurt and you're going to be angry in the coming days. I'm heartbroken. 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 It's crazy. I got up, or I walked back in the bathroom because I get up earlier and everybody, especially on Sundays. And Angie looks at her memories, and it's crazy. Five years ago, today, 
Derek was ordained as a pastor. I had been a pastor for years, but we, we, a year and a half before that, we dreamed. To, we, we, God individually spoke to us that we were going to plant a church called Catalyst. We didn't know how it was going to happen. We knew we'd never leave the church and, but, that we were in, but we had a dream. And we dreamed this vision together. And God has blown our minds with the dream that he gave us individually. And it's been beautiful. And I'm heartbroken because the dream that God gave us, we will no longer build together. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to, to have to see Happy Hill hurt. Happy Hill is the Harper family. They are living on Happy Hill Road for those that don't know. I'm heartbroken. I told you where I am and I'm not afraid of telling it because I'm human. Let me tell you what I'm not. Let me tell you what I'm not. I'm not afraid of it. Catalyst Church will not hide from it. We will address this and we will deal with it. We already are. And we will move forward. We're not okay with it but we will deal with it. I also want you to know that the same love that I preach, that Catalyst has preached from this stage for over three and a half years applies to Derek even when he hasn't applied it to himself. I want you to know that the same love that I preach to you and will preach to everybody who comes in this place for years to come applies to my brother Yeah, I'm, so obviously you get this. I'm the lead pastor now, no longer co-lead pastor. I want you to know this. I was born for this. I was built for this, and that has not changed. On, I can assure you that I'm a better version of being Bonner I'm the best version of Ben Bonner to date, and that will be true tomorrow, next week, and next year, and I guarantee it. Because I am very aware that the gospel can only do as much as you let it. I can tell you that I may be heartbroken and crushed, but I will not stay heartbroken and crushed. I can tell you that Angie and I, my wife, who had to, we had somebody sick and she had to fill in in tech team. She's back there. I can tell you that we believe in this place and we still believe in this place and the heart of Catalyst Church, we believe in it and we, and, and we will, I, we, I'm, I don't just preach messages, I believe in them and I pour my life into them. And so does Angie. I usually don't share stuff like this but I want you to know how much I believe in it. I want you to know how much I believe in it and why I believe it and what I do to show that I believe in it, not just say it. Angie and I, this year right now, and it may be a lot more, we're on pace to give over 30% of our income to Catalyst. And when I say that, when I say that, that does not include the fact that we have never grown large enough as a church to have a budget to take people out to meetings and to lunch. And, and so I, and anybody who's heard me preach long, you know when I take somebody out to eat, I don't leave 20% tips. I've had some people like, that's a little bit too much. You're asking me to leave more than 20? That's what they ask. Let me tell you why I don't leave 20%. Because the God that I preach about and believe in does not promise that he just gives us good enough. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and to the abundance, overflow. I serve the God that King David was running for his life from King Saul and King Saul was trying to kill him and King David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want and my cup runneth over. That doesn't sound like just enough to me. 
I serve the God that the Apostle Paul said that he wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask or imagine. So by God, I don't just preach about a God who is generous with everything he gives us. I, 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 we practice it. Sarah Harper. Sarah Harper, man. She, I've always respected her. She's always been an inspiration. But the last two weeks, man, I mean, she like, with me and Angie, like she, she went up a couple levels. One of the first questions I ask her is I begin to counsel her and everybody in the situation. I begin to counsel her and I ask Sarah, I said, Sarah, I want, I want to know honestly, do you hold any resentment towards Catalyst? Probably one of the most encouraging moments in those weeks. She said, no. She said, Catalyst changed my life. And she said, I've always loved Jesus, but the last couple of years at Catalyst, I learned how to place my value in Jesus. And just so you know, Sarah Harper's not in here right now, not because she's afraid to be, because she said, I want to serve in catechism so that one more person can have a seat in here to hear this message. Because she does believe in Catalyst. And she has let it change her life. Derek may be lost, but I'm going to tell you, lost in this season, but a lot of, a lot of, a lot of it. A lot of y'all are. A lot of everybody is. But I'm going to tell you something about being lost. You may be lost, but you're loved. Derek may be lost right now and need to find himself, but he's loved. You may be heartbroken. You may be pissed, but you're loved. You may be depressed, you may be addicted, you may be stressed out, you may be, have no confidence, you may not know how to put one foot in front of the other, but you are loved. Period. You're loved. You're loved. You're loved. And I'm going to go ahead. I got a few more minutes. They can play behind me. I got a few more minutes. Y'all good with that? I want to go ahead right now real quick and attack the biggest criticism of me as a communicator and I want to nip it in the bud so if you hear about it, you'll, say, you'll tell them just go, go check out this part of the message. I can feel it coming already and it's okay because I don't even like that criticism. It's not true. I can hear it says, man, get church, you know, they don't, they don't take a firm stance on fill in the blank, whatever sin. That's a, I can hear it coming. That's because they don't preach on sin enough. I know it's coming. I'm not angry about it. I'm just going to go ahead and give you my answer before they even put it out there. I preach on sin and repentance every freaking Sunday. I just don't preach it the way a lot of people preach it. I'm going to tell you something. I don't preach about your sore throat when you got cancer because cancer is way worse than a sore throat. I don't. I don't. And I won't. The word sin in the Bible actually just means missing the mark. And we all in some places of our life miss the mark of the things that matter. And the love of Jesus is supposed to bring us back so that we can gravitate back towards what matters. And King, King Solomon wrote a verse I'm about to read to you and when he wrote this verse he lost himself after he wrote it and he stopped applying the verse I'm about to read to you and it stopped changing it stopped changing his life when he stopped doing something with it but this verse is beautiful and King Solomon may have lost himself but it still applies Proverbs 4.23 says above all else guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I'm going to tell you something, King Solomon, that's how, you, that's how I preach on sin. Every Sunday. It doesn't look classy or churchy or appropriate to guard your heart sometimes. You may hurt some people's feelings. I'm going to tell you some godly decisions you have to make in your life, other people may tell you you're not godly. The, the relationships you need to sever, the places you need to quit going, the things you need to quit doing, there's some people that may accuse you of not being Christian. But King Solomon says above all else, protect your heart. 
I don't focus on symptoms for a reason. You treat COVID-19 with treating symptoms. Jesus went to the cross to heal the heart, top to bottom. When you find out how loved you are and when you start making decisions that have a health, that keep your heart healthy the rest of your life and the stupid things you do and the small things we do to push him and other people away will take care of themselves. I preach from the same book. Catalyst is not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to get back to it. Yeah, there's some things in your life that you don't need to just chop down the trees and you don't need to just pull up weeds. You need to take the entire roots up. You need to burn some plows so that nothing that does, nothing has a chance to grow back that you chose to walk away from. And that is why in this season so many people have been disconnected and are walking, don't even know why they're broken hearted. It's not because of symptoms, it's because of the heart. I'm done with that now. I hope you can hear my heart, Catalyst. I hope you can hear my heart. I hope you can hang on and I hope you can see what a church moving forward looks like. I hope you know that every decision every decision that will be made in the coming weeks when it's finalized I will email it personally to every one of you you will be in the loop you will know what we're going to do because there needs to be this place is beautiful and we are not going to let it grow any further without putting protection so that things like this don't happen to people again and I know there's so much to that that some of you don't know what it looks like, well, I'll let you know. I'll send you the decisions when they're made. I met with Shannon Lovelady, the pastor at Southern Hills, who is the one that's responsible for us being this facility. And, and I spent Thursday, I spent three hours with him, and he invested, and he's going to continue to invest in me and Catalyst, and he's going to help us because they dealt with this in this facility seven years ago, the same stuff. And Shannon encouraged me and and I know I'm going to need help too and I know that you may trust me but there's no way for you not to be concerned and I promise you that I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pour into pastors and I'm going to let Shannon pour into me and I know that some of you there's maybe some of you that um you just can't trust and all I can do is bear my heart and I hope that you will, you will see in the coming weeks and months what a church moving forward looks like. Things will look different. There may be some people that look different on the stage and things will look different, but the God we serve is the same. And the place that makes this beautiful, the message of this place, the heart of this place, and the people that are a part of the family will not change. And that is why this place is growing. And that is why it will continue to grow. And I want you to know that if you feel like that you can't trust because there's so many wounds out there, walls go up so quick. And I want you to know if you walk out of this place and never come back to Catalyst and you can't trust it, yeah, I understand how you feel. I understand it. I want to beg you this. I want to beg you this. Because we planted this church for people wounded by church. If you don't come back to Catalyst, all I ask is don't stop loving Jesus. Because he will give you everything you need. And people who follow Jesus mess up. But Jesus will never mess up. And if you lose trust in me and this leadership, and you lose trust in this church, all I ask is please don't look, please don't lose trust in Jesus. Please don't. dog tag I started wearing in the seventh grade seventh grade this is my youngest son's age on the camera back there 12 I wore it until I was 29 years old on my honeymoon because <laughs> you know this you know there was a time this was kind of cool but most of it it was long gone when I finally took it off I'm not in the military so it was lame I never took it off from 12 to 29 it's faded. You can't even see what's on it, but I'm about to tell you what was on it. Um, I, 
I looked at Angie on her honeymoon and I said, babe, I said, what do you think about me keeping this on? And she, you know, Angie's not the type to tell you that looks like crap because she'll say, don't you tell her. I didn't say that, but I know her. And I knew her on her honeymoon. And she said, oh, whatever you want to do. And I said, new honeymoon. Now she'd be like, yeah, you, you don't look great. So I took it off and I put it in my drawer beside my bed over five years ago. Five and, over like five and a half years ago. I wore this in some of the longest, hardest seasons of my life. I wore this when I was di- I'd just been diagnosed with Tourette's and I walked around in slobber. I remember the girls in junior high saying, gross, because I had side effects to medicine. I don't have a lot of memories of middle school because I was trying to stop my ticks and slobber would hit the gym floor. I wore it in that season. I wore it when I preached my dad's funeral. When I was angry like now and I preached the gospel that I had to process through. I wore it through some lonely years because I tell you what God has given me now I did not have all the time all my single people I wore this and I was single probably a lot longer than you I kept wearing it and I'm going to tell you why I took it off at 29 because I no longer had to wear it on my neck to be reminded of the promise that is on the dog tag that you can't see anymore. It's a scripture that's going to come up on the screen from Isaiah 54, verse 17. It says, No weapon formed against me or you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against me or you shall fall because my righteousness is of the Lord. And so it is. I don't have to wear it on my neck. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. And I don't say that from a place of bitterness. I'm not angry at any critics that come my way. I'm not angry. I can take anything that comes at me because I know that in my life I have always tried to do right by everybody. And I give you this verse as a promise for your situation and a promise for our church's situation. I give you this promise. I will. I have nothing to hide and nothing to prove. Nothing to hide and nothing to prove. I promise you that I will continue to seek God every single day and I will step up here and I will not just preach a message and pastor the people. I will pour my life into seeking God and doing right by everybody. The reason I can promise that is that's the person I've always been. I just want to keep getting better at it because that's the point of the gospel. And I give you my word. And that is what it will be. And lastly, I'm almost done. I know you're like, thank God. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was a, you know, he lost himself his entire life. He was killing Christians, you know. He got knocked off his ass. Go look it up, it's true. Knocked off his ass. But guess what? It overhauled his whole life. And we still read the words and wisdom of the Apostle Paul. Because God overhauled his life and kicked him off his ass. And he did something about it. He didn't just stay down. And there's a verse that I love. Paul says, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in me and you a far more exceeding way to glory. He says, no matter how long your heartbreak lasts, no matter how long this season of struggle lasts, he says that whatever you go through will be nothing compared to what God wants to do with it if you want. He says, this season, it may last a while, but it won't last forever. And what you get out of this season when you grow through it will eternally outweigh it. He says, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in me a far more exceeding weight of glory. And I'm going to tell you something, Catalyst Church, my entire life, God has always preceded heartbreak before he blew my mind. Because God has always given me what he promised even when he didn't give, it, give me what he planned. And this catalyst will be no different. This will be 
no different. I know some of you, I hope some of you are like, what can I do? How can I be a part? You're like, what can I do? Let me give you a few examples. Number one is easy, it's encouragement. I'm going to be reading any encouragement or text. I'm going to read them to our staff. I'm, no, I'm not going to hold them back. I'm going to read them. Some of you, um, you're the type, you put everything else on, on social media. Why don't you put something so that, like, I'm, I'm a proud Catafam. I'm moving forward with my Catafam. Whatever you want, encouragement. If you believe in this place, God, we need, to, we need the encouragement because to, we know we got our work cut out for us and we're going we're, we're gonna to be fine. But we love encouragement. Two, check back into life. Oh, my gosh. I hope you all hear me. Check back into life first and then check back into Catalyst. You believe it. Check back into life. Check back be faithful. If you believe in this place, don't just believe in it. Be a part of it. Now is a great time as we're overhauling the entire structure. It's a great time to either serve or if you want to change where you serve, find where you fit. And let's move forward. You can send a text to me and we're going to move forward as a church. And lastly, COVID-19, I know a lot of people make less money, but I also know between talking to pastors in the community, a lot of people just forget. And if you, we don't ask anybody to invest in this place unless you believe in it. So if you don't believe in it, I'm not talking to you. But if you believe in it, continue to be faithful financially because everything we've been able to do and will be able to do is because every one of you give what you can and don't be embarrassed of how small it is because you remember Jesus gave Jesus fed 5,000 people with a fish dinner because the guys the kids said here you go Jesus so if you believe in it be a part of it my heart is broken my heart is absolutely broken and we are going to be a church that worships so what I'm going to ask you to do we got just a few more minutes but before we do that will you stand up with me because I'm hurting I know you're hurting and I know we got a process but what we're going to do right now is we're going to set the precedent for the church that we're going to be we are going to worship when we're hurting we're going to worship when we're worried we're going to worship when people disappoint us we're going to worship y'all ready